Hello and welcome everyone to the webinar on practical conservation tillage for organic production in the Western region by Mark Schoenbeck. This is the third presentation in the Organic Farming and Soil Health in the Western US webinar series, which is organized by the Organic Farming Research Foundation and hosted by eOrganic with funding from Western SARE. I'm your host, Alice Formiga of eOrganic. eOrganic has many articles, videos, and webinars about organic farming and research, and you can find all of them on our website and on the eOrganic YouTube channel. We are recording this webinar, and we will have the recording available on YouTube within one to two weeks. This webinar will be presented by Mark Schoenbeck, who is a research associate at the Organic Farming Research Foundation. Mark has worked for the last 31 years as a researcher, consultant, and educator about organic farming and sustainable agriculture. He also works with the Virginia Association for Biological Farming. We also have Don Tilmani with us from Colorado State University, and she is going to be online for the question and answer session in case there is anything related to her area of expertise. Um, she's a professor of agroeconomics with Colorado State University and specializes in economic development related to local organic and other value added food market segments. So now, Mark, I am going to hand over the remote control to you. All right, thank you. Um, so um, one of the first things I like to cover in these webinars is uh, discuss the research priorities of uh, Western region organic farmers. This is based on a survey that um, the Organic Farming Research Foundation conducted during 2015 and <clears throat> a published a report in 2016, which became the uh, National Organic Research Agenda. Uh, not surprisingly, the largest percentage uh, of farmers identified soil health as a high research priority, 71% in the Western region. This is based on 555 respondents and also a series of six listening sessions. Um, and within the topic of um, uh, healthy soils, which of course are the basis of organic farming, some of the questions related to tillage included um, the effects on soil biology, soil life, effects on soil carbon, um, how to build soil organic matter with uh, minimum tillage, uh, tillage and crop rotation effects on, on uh, the interaction between weeds and soils and crops, and then one weed continued uh, to rear its ugly head, uh, field bindweed, uh, which I'm sure a lot of you are quite familiar with, more so than I am. Um, so these are some of the topics and that we'll try to cover during this uh, session. Okay, well, how does tillage affect soil health? Um, well, here's how it affects the physical properties. Um, <clears throat> if the soil is even somewhat dry when you're out there with your tillage implement and you're doing full width tillage, uh, you're going to be losing some of the soil to the wind. And also stirring the soil surface exposes the organic matter to oxidation. Um, and of course, even if this weren't happening during the tillage, the uh, bare soil period afterwards, uh, subject to wind and water erosion, surface crusting, when rain falls on an uncovered surface, it tends to seal uh, to a greater or lesser extent. Um, it also increases soil temperatures so that that top inch or so may become so hot as to be inhospitable to soil life. So that soil life will go dormant, or even partially die out in that very surface area, uh, part of the soil. And <clears throat> the aeration and the pulverization causes some other changes um, by loosening the soil, it is more subject to erosion and also compaction. And you will reduce, uh, have some loss of uh, moisture holding capacity as well. And this is how soil, uh, tillage affects biological properties. Um, <clears throat> the uh, tilling action uh, stimulates certain microbial, uh, microbes to increase their respiratory activity. And in fact, the ratio between what's called maintenance respiration, how much of the soil organic residues are simply turning into carbon dioxide versus how much goes into growing new microbes and uh, new microbial residues uh, that has increased, that this increases the release of nutrients, uh, crop nutrients, uh, but it also burns up the organic matter. And of course, uh, the more the, the more intensive the physical disturbance, the more you lose larger organisms like earthworms and the microarthropods 
and also the fungal networks, although fun fungi on an individual basis are microbes and that the filaments are very microscopic, the length and the extent of those networks uh, can actually cover many square feet, even an acre. So uh, you're breaking up those networks. And then one of the things that happens is whenever you remove the living cover, the uh, primary source of food for the soil life is uh, at least temporarily cut off. As long as there's nothing growing, there's no root exudates and no root deposition going into the soil. And that is, a, that is like the staple um, in the diet of the soil life. Uh, so that creates a hiatus in that uh, flow of nutrients uh, to the soil food web. And when you have inversion tillage that you see in this picture, this was on a, a muck soil. It was a fairly shallow depth down to the sandy subsoil. And you can see what happened there when a plow was run through and it brought some of that subsoil to the surface. And even if that doesn't occur visibly, you've disrupted habitat, broken up earthworm burrows, uh, buried the most biologically active surface organisms under several inches of soil. So it's like having your house turned upside down. <clears throat> so organic farmers face a dilemma. Uh, they're not using our herbicides, so there would there's bound to be some need for tillage to manage cover crop residues and of course to manage weeds so that they don't outcompete the crops. And so in this in the picture here, you have this, you see the farmer tilling in um, a recently mowed uh, cover crop that's quite a substantial biomass, so it's feeding the soil, but at the same time it's disturbing the soil at, um, to a pretty fair extent. That's a rototiller there. Um, so the national organic rule here says that the organic producer must use tillage practices that will maintain or improve the physical, biological, and chemical condition of the soil and minimize soil erosion. Basically, find a way to, that maintains soil health. And that's almost a paradox, and yet um, it, it basically sums up the challenge that, that we're all facing. So um, research has shown that on all these aspects of soil health, the NRCS four principles of soil health management are, is an excellent pace, place to start. Simply keeping the soil covered by living or, or residue uh, plant material. Um, <clears throat> as an excellent farmer in North Dakota, uh, Gabe Brown it has a 5,000 acre ranch. He calls it keeping the soil armored. It keeps the surface covered so that the impacts of raindrops don't disrupt and uh, seal over the surface and cause erosion. Um, it also keeps the soil surface from getting too hot. Maintaining living roots, that is that uh, food pipeline to all of the soil life. The more biomass you have growing above ground, the more root exudates and root turnover you have, the small roots dying and providing a continual supply of food, the more you will support an active and healthy soil food web. And building soil biodiversity, this is done through diversifying what's growing above ground. Um, each crop has a different root architecture, each crop species, a different set of exudates and uh, other materials sloughed from the roots. And it will also send out a different set of specific signals that either encourage or discourage specific soil organisms to associate with uh, grow in the root zone. And of course, minimizing soil disturbance. And this includes both physical disturbance uh, tillage, um, overgrazing, which compacts the surface, uh, traffic, et cetera, and also chemical disturbance, so the use of synthetic chemicals. Um, high levels of soluble fertilizers definitely disrupt the soil, uh, soil life. Um, and of course, anytime you spray a, a crop protection chemical intended to kill a certain pest organism or disease organism, it will have some effect on the soil life. So two parallel uh, complementary approaches to a minimizing disturbance, uh, conservation agriculture uh, basically eliminates physical disturbance going by going continuous no-till and then allows some use of the um, synthetic chemicals as, on an as-needed basis, although it definitely aims to reduce it. Um, and the other uh, organic agriculture uh, through the um, National Organic Program uh, rules uh, standards eliminates chemical disturbance by prohibiting synthetics and as noted earlier allows for judicious tillage so there's some physical disturbance in that situ in that situation 
Uh, another, th another way to build soil biodiversity is crop, crop livestock integration. And uh, related to that is uh, management intensive rotational grazing systems, um, which have shown a lot of benefits in building soil health. So let's put no-till into perspective. Um, there are some uh, soil scientists, conservationists who say you cannot conserve soil without, uh, without going continuous no-till. And this really puts the organic farmer in a bind because you know, once in a while you got perennial weed, you gotta get out there with some form of tillage implement if you're gonna make a living. And hey, I'd rather so see an organic field get tilled up than have the farmer go out of business and it sprout condominiums or worse. So um, there have been a number of other uh, uh, research studies on no-till uh, by itself and no-till integrated with other practices uh, that pertain to those four uh, principles of soil health. Continuous no-till in and of itself, uh, particularly within the context of a conventional rotation such as corn, soy, wheat, uh, with no cover crops, uh, some bare soil periods in there, that builds some soil organic matter near the surface in comparison to co conventional, the same rotation and inputs with tillage. However, a lot of this soil organic matter is lost after one tillage pass because it's protected physically in aggregates, large aggregates. So um, even one light tillage pass will tend to break some of those aggregates and you'll have a lot of that um, accrual reversed. And one of the things that a number of studies in the semi-arid interior, north central and northwestern regions, uh, wheat fallow rotations, which are often the traditional um, farming system, a year of, of winter wheat uh, planted in the late summer, harvested in the early summer of the next year, followed by 12 to 14 minutes of, um, months of fallow to, uh, in the, with the intent of saving up a year's worth of moisture so that you use two years of moisture to grow your wheat crop. Unfortunately, even with continuous no-till, this um, cannot prevent the loss of organic matter. Soils degrade in continuous, in uh, wheat fallow rotations, even without tillage. However, if you diversify the rotation and you make sure there is some crop growing each year, perhaps a shallow rooted one that serves, uh, saves moisture, um, you can build, uh, gradually build soil organic matter in those uh, dryland soils. As a number of studies with diversified rotations that have deep rooted crops and a high diversity of crops, that building the organic matter is throughout the soil profile. So that if you have to come in until three or four inches deep, to uh, deal with weeds, you are not going to be destroying all that organic matter. And a lot of the organic matter that's formed through maximizing uh, living root and maximizing plant cover and diversity is of a more stable sort than that that simply accrued near the surface through no-till. And there've been a number, number of studies with integrated organic systems that include some tillage, and they will build as much or more soil organic matter than the conventional continuous no-till. There's one uh, study out in uh, Beltsville, Maryland. I know that's not in the Western region, but it, it does have uh, some relevance to the whole country. Um, but the organic system that included some tillage every year, uh, one pass every year, uh, accrued about twice as much soil organic matter over 13 years as the continuous no-till system. Um, and I want to point out there's a farm um, in Mount Montana, um, Doug and Anna Crabtree um, managed 7,000 acres of dry land grains and pulses in a highly diversified rotation. They do not fallow. They use, um, this is Villicus Farms uh, in Hill County of um, Montana. We'll talk a little bit more about some of their work, but um, they have built soil organic matter substantially over a number of years and uh, main, and improved the soil moisture holding capacity as well. And they do till some, of course, they take great care to uh, minimize soil damage. So cover crops, uh, tilled organic systems that build soil organic matter have two main characteristics, uh, key characteristics to note. One is they maintain soil cover and living roots as much of the year as possible. You do not see a lot of bare soil in that rotation and cover crops play a major role. Um, some cover crops actually provide what might be thought of as biological tillage because they send deep roots down as far as five feet and open up the soil profile. Uh, they can actively penetrate hard pans that will uh, deter a lot of uh, production crop roots and 
severely restrict their, their uh, ability to obtain deep moisture and nutrients. For instance, uh, tillage radish is an excellent example. It'll just break right through a hard pan and the following crop is shown to send its roots much deeper. And um, it benefits the yields of those crops partly through conserving and recycling nutrients, but partly through improving those, the rooting depth and the moisture capacity uh, access. Perennial sod phase is an excellent practice in general for restoring soil because it provides continuous living roots in a, in a protracted period of uh, no-till. Uh, even one year, but especially your two or three years, uh, you'll see an enhancement of uh, overall fertility, soil health. The annual weed seed bank tends to run down between the fact that those weeds are not able to complete their life cycle and uh, weed seed consumers that live in the uh, continuous sod will draw the existing weed seed bank down. Very often you see an improvement in yields after that sod break. The big caveat is that in areas of low rainfall, the sod may deplete soil moisture and a deep rooted sod um, sometimes has been observed to deplete uh, soil moisture so badly that the next two or three years of production crops suffer a yield reduction um, as a result of that limitation. So uh, with that one caveat, um, in appropriate situations, this is an excellent practice. Uh, here's a few strategies for reducing tillage. One is just reduce the number of passes. Every time you take a tillage implement into the field, you're creating some disturbance. You're gonna lose some organic matter, lose some soil life. Uh, so if you can re simply reduce the number of passes. Another is to till more shallowly. A um, Couple of implements that uh, allow shallow tillage is uh, something called a power harrow. It's really good for creating a seed bed where the residues are not too heavy. Um, and the blade plow or sweet plow undercutter, I've not actually seen one of these in person being from the East Coast, but the more I read about um, Western region agricultural challenges and um, uh, solutions, the more I learn how important a tool this is, it basically undercuts the existing vegetation a very short distance below the surface. It takes out the root crowns, leaves most of the residue on the surface and leaves most of the soil profile undisturbed. Uh, Non-inversion tillage is another way to approach this. Uh, chisel plow, spading machine, we'll talk about the spading machine a little bit more in, in a little bit. Also uh, tilling, not the whole fields, doing a strip or ridge till. And that's a very interesting strategy because it concentrates the benefits of tillage, which include nutrient release and uh, more uh, complete weed control right in the crop row where it's most critical. And it reduces the adverse effects by not disturbing the between row spaces. And then there's rotational no-till. We do not have any means to do continuous no-till in an organic system at this time in an annual crop rotation. However, um, some, major primary tillage events can be eliminated by roll crimping the cover crop and planting uh, the cash crop no-till through that. But let's go back to fewer passes of a classic example right here, just using straw. If this farmer had not put a, down a good straw mulch on the tomato and pepper crop here, he would have been out there uh, hoeing or cultivating at least a couple more times to keep the weeds down. So right there, uh, any kind of uh, integrated weed management that uses multiple tactics and reduces the number of times you have to get out there and cultivate, um, that is reducing tillage. One thing to remember is you always wanna um, ask yourself, do you really need to till right now? And if so, what is your purpose in doing the tillage? Because for, for instance, that very fine seed bed on the left that may be important for something like planting carrots, but having worked the soil that fine is even more vulnerable to both wind and water erosion and uh, simply compaction and, and surface crusting if you get a heavy shower on that. So if you're planting something with larger seeds like beans, you're putting garlic cloves or potato, uh, seed potatoes, and you could certainly go with the more uh, coarser seed bed that you see on either side of this fine tilled pass and maybe you don't even need that much tillage. Another thing, if you've had a summer cover crop growing like this pearl millet over here, and you get a heavy frost in October and it's, and it's killed, definitely don't be in a hurry to till that under. In fact, leaving it standing or maybe rolling it so that it's easier to manage in the spring, but you don't wanna 
um, disturb the soil and the root mass um, in the fall if you can avoid it. There may be some circumstances where leaving residues over winter will create excessively wet conditions for getting an early crop in, and then perhaps you need to make some kind of compromise. Um, another thing that happens though, if you leave those residues in place is you're leaving the soil surface habitat undisturbed. So the ground beetles and the other weed seed consumers will clean up any weeds that have grown and set seed during the course of the year. And of course, if that cover crop was really thick, it probably wouldn't have any weeds, but you definitely want that cleanup crew to be able to do its job. So uh, just addressing a couple of very invasive weeds. Uh, we have Canadian Canada thistle here in Virginia. Um, it's been a pretty serious weed for us as well. I know it's very serious out in large part sections of the Northwest. I'm less familiar with field bindweed. We have its um, kid brother, hedge bindweed, and it's, it's bad enough, but um, these pose a real challenge. Uh, you really can't stop either of these with a roll crib cover crop or with very, very low level of tillage. So we need to find ways to hit them with as many different um, weed IPM strategies as possible. Uh, there are some recently awarded Organic Research and Extension Initiative grants that are looking into biological control. The bindweed, um, there is something called the bindweed moth uh, that's been found to be a very good biocontrol, um, eats them down quite a bit. And Canada thistle is subject to a rust fungus, which fortunately does not attack most of our crops, fairly specific for thistles. Um, so integrating these with grazing and mowing, uh, crop diversification, direct competition from crops. Uh, there's been some progress of using uh, steam, um, like a steam weeding treatment uh, at a certain temperature and tractor speed has been found to significantly reduce the vigor of the bindweed. Um, and of course you will have some tillage and cultivation, but with all these other tactics, you won't need as much and you won't be sacrificing your soil quality to get these stubborn weeds under control. Um, research is in progress on that. Okay, here's another thing. Um, you don't necessarily have to go out and buy a fancy tillage, uh, a new tool to go from beating the soil to a um, pulverized uh, erosion uh, prone state to being gentler on it. Um, a couple of farmers have shown me ways that you can tame the rototiller as I call it. On the left is a farmer in uh, uh, east in the uh, coastal region of Virginia. Uh, He's rigged that till, a rototiller to work only one inch deep. And so in one pass, he's taking out germinating weeds and planting the cover crop that he has just broadcast. On the right hand, uh, Rick Felker on the Eastern shore of Virginia, that is a loamy sand soil. And you can see it has considerable organic matter and it has some soil structure. The way he manages this is his tillage regime is a, uh, a bed shaper, which rebuilds the bed every year and um, that uh, is a fairly gentle way to build the beds and then runs the rototiller with a higher tractor speed and a lower PTO speed so that instead of beating the soil uh, really uh, severely, it's more gently going through almost like a harrow to create a seed bed. And he has found he's been able to build organic matter on a loamy sand soil in those circumstances. Uh, these are techniques that can be applied anywhere as far as I, I know, um, and I'd be interested in hearing others' experiences of that. Here's a newer implement. The power harrow uh, creates a, sh uh, a similar uh, seed bed to what you saw with the rototiller at the uh, low rotary speed. Uh, it's uh, good for making a seed bed, incorporating uh, amendments, taking out small weeds, leaves most of the rest of the soil profile undisturbed. And there've been a number of meta-analyses, which are research studies that look at experiments that have been conducted in all different parts, all different bio uh, agricultural regions around the world. Um, and then compiling, getting a, um, an average, getting, getting a sense of what the overall benefit is. And uh, these studies have found that doing shallow tillage versus doing a standard plow disc really does allow more soil life to uh, continue. There's less adverse impacts on soil life with this method. And the same can be said for chisel plowing as opposed to uh, moldboard plowing. 
Um, and that was, and that is reflected in the um, NRCS. They have a, a system for estimating how severely the soil is being tilled called the soil tillage intensity rating. And they add up all of the field passes during the course of the year. If it's less than 20, it's considered no-till. Um, it could be some, you know, like a planter would just open the soil slot and have just be a few points. Um, I believe up to 80 is considered reduced till. A uh, single pass with a moldboard plow would be 100, whereas a chisel plow would be only 45. And a shallow till implement like this or like a light disc would be more like 20. So we can see not all tillage is alike. And uh, there are definitely benefits um, to taking steps towards uh, less disruptive tillage. This is the blade plow. I got some pictures uh, from University of Nebraska. They did some studies in the western part of the state. If you terminate a cover crop with this implement and grow corn and soybean afterwards, you have yield improvements from the cover crop uh, plus undercut tillage. Whereas if the cover crop is simply disked in, just in a, a standard uh, couple passes with a disk, uh, the soybeans showed a yield loss because there was more moisture loss. With this implement, you see that uh, the residues left on the surface conserving moisture and the fact that it, it undercuts fairly shallowly allows um, most of the soil to remain undisturbed. Uh, it's been used for terminating cover crops, uh, for uh, uh, weed control during the fallow period of a rotation, um, and, any, and also high residue cultivation. There are other implements that of a similar design that run between the rows and up close to, but not into the row and undercut most of the weeds in a high residue uh, system. And uh, studies in uh, the interior Pacific Northwest have confirmed that using this uh, tool in lieu of the disc will uh, save moisture and reduce wind erosion. And then I mentioned deep tillage without inversion, uh, that moldboard plow on the left, that was uh, many years ago, I took that picture. And yeah, it's turning the whole soil upside down. These are great seed bed, but uh, definitely quite disruptive. Uh, garden scale, the broad fork is a really fine tool. A lot, a lot of gardeners consider themselves no-till and they will broad fork once a year. And you're really gently fracturing the soil, uh, breaking up hard pan, loosening weeds, you can then pull them out. Um, here it's being used to dig carrots, also another relatively um, a, a good way to use it. Um, chisel plow at the farm scale is um, an example of a non-inversion deep tillage tool. And it can be used to break through hard pan, even to break sod. Um, and these are the situations where you're gonna actually need to do, maybe do some deep tillage if you're doing an organic farm. You have to, if you have a hard pan, you gotta break through a lot of times cover crops will do that work. Uh, on some occasions, it may be uh, the best bet to do it first with a tool and then follow with a cover crop. Uh, breaking sod is very hard to do unless you're gonna uh, on a small enough scale that you can do it with tarps and just kill it no-till that way with opaque tarps. Uh, larger weeds sometimes require the deeper tillage. Um, rotary spade or spading machine, um, this is probably one of the best inventions for uh, smaller scale vegetable growers. It is, it, it's a fairly slow process. You have to drive through the field gradually, but uh, this can actually break sod and make at least a coarse seed bed, something that's suitable for planting potatoes, for instance, in one pass into sod or a very heavy cover crop. Um, with less residue, one pass will leave you a, a seed bed that you can plant just about anything in. It's a lot gentler on soil aggregates than rototilling uh, or heavy disking. Uh, does not create a tillage hard pan. In fact, it relieves hard pan. In Washington State University, multi-year uh, farming system trials where they looked at the rotary spader versus uh, plowing and disking, uh, this implement caused a substantial reduction in compaction between five and 12 inches below the surface. And in about a third of the, about 25% of the um, site years, they actually saw an improvement in crop yields. So this became their standard uh, full tillage implement tool when they uh, did further studies on uh, minimum till and strip tillage. So here's another strategy, till only part of the fields, um, the strip tillage I've mentioned. Uh, this concept of soil functional zone management was developed by uh, Williams and others, a uh, group of researchers uh, working in the Midwest. They looked at several farms where they used a ridge tillage system 
And the idea is to say, okay, we need to take out the weeds, we need to get the soil warm, we need some nitrogen available to get our cash crop going. But we don't have to till up the whole field to do that. If you got a wide space, you know, you got tomatoes planted in rows five feet apart or corn planted in rows three feet apart, you can say, okay, well, let's do like work up a six or eight or 10 inch wide strip right where the crop is. Uh, encourage the bacteria to multiply, you know, maybe sacrifice some fungi, but you're encouraging that nutrient release. You've taken out the weeds, you've created a seed bed, you're accelerating the warming, but then you leave 60 to 75% of the field undisturbed between the uh, tilled rows. Um, and there are other zone, what I call zone management strategies. You want to get the nutrients uh, to where the crops are, and you don't want to uh, be feeding the weeds. So in this um, uh, picture right here, you see the bed tops. This is an um, organic vegetable uh, production, actually a field trial uh, at a research station here in Virginia. There is a, um, a legume cover crop, in this case sun hemp, planted in the crop row, which is going to be the top of the bed where they're going to be a double row of uh, broccoli in the fall. And between the rows, that's Sorghum Sudan, which is going to create lots of biomass, lots of roots, suppress weeds, and tie up nitrogen. So there's not going to be much nitrogen available to feed the weeds in the rows, but there's going to be more nitrogen in the in the crop row, or right on the on the on what's called the grow zone, the bed top. Down below we have drip irrigated lettuce, and this can often be used to drip fertigate. Uh, there are some formulations of organic uh, fish seaweed-based fertilizers that can be used in uh, uh, drip uh, systems, although I've heard there's still some problems to iron out. But if you drip fertigate, uh, you're then feeding the crop and not the weed. So here we go, uh, strip tillage, a couple of examples at Washington State University, and uh, this is one here at North Carolina um, Agriculture and Technology State University in Greensboro. Uh, this implement has an opening coulter and then a shank and a narrow rolling basket and uh, some closing coulters basically leaves a narrow strip that has been worked up and ready to receive uh, a crop. Uh, this one has a slightly different rig, but it's uh, again, leaving these narrow strips. And here's some cross planted in strip till situations. Those are tomatoes in five foot centers. In this case, it was simply a small walk behind rototiller. So instead of tilling the whole field, uh, the farmer worked up the rows just for the tomatoes and let the rye crop grow and just mowed it periodically so uh, that it provided a, a weed-free um, and also a mud-free alley to walk on between the tomato rows. Uh, these are peanuts that were planted uh, into a strip-tilled field, um, also doing quite well. Um, so this is ridge tillage, often practiced in the, in the Midwest. Uh, the soil is shaped into ridges and a cover crop is planted or simply in this case the uh, residue of the cash crop is left on the surface. And then in the spring, the top of the ridge is, is, is basically cleared off. There's a shallow tillage operation to move the residues off the top and leave a seed bed. There's soybeans coming up in that seed bed. Later in the year, um, when there are a few weeds coming up, they go through with some kind of a high residue cultivator. Uh, which could be a, a sweep type of implement. And that takes weeds out and it also moves some of those residues into the row. So you're moving um, organic uh, nutrients basically back into the crop row. Um, and the studies by this um, Williams and others that was published in Agriculture Ecosystems and the Environment, they'll be listed in the, in the uh, supplemental notes. Um, they looked at the several parameters of soil biological activity and verified that you increased the important function of nutrient release in the row and the equally important functions of carbon sequestration and stabilization and also basically conserving the soil, leaving the soil mostly undisturbed between the rows. Okay. So rotational no-till, um, many of you may be familiar with this procedure, so I'll go through this fairly quickly. Uh, basically, the first step is you got to grow a really high biomass cover crop, and you need to grow it to maturity. Um, all of these crops that you see are high biomass in that they have three tons or more of uh, dry uh, weight biomass per acre above ground and probably half again as much below ground. Uh, these two on the left are actually up around five tons per acre, and they are also in full bloom, full to late bloom. You want the rye to be shedding pollen 
in this case, it's triticale, but uh, the cereal grain should be either in the process or finished shedding pollen. Um, here's pearl millet also in that stage of full to late bloom. You can see the heads there. Uh, there is some sun hemp there. Uh, it's also uh, blooming. Over here, it's not quite yet, they're not quite flowering yet. The oats and the bell beans are still in the vegetative state and the same with the foxtail millet and the cowpea. So they need another couple of weeks there before they're ready to be terminated uh, with uh, a roller crimper or a mower. So the second step in this rotational no-till system is uh, you've, a lot of people are now by now familiar with the roller crimper. Uh, another way is to go through with a flail mower, which leaves a fairly evenly distributed residue. Uh, there are both advantages and disadvantages to the flail mower approach um, in that um, the weeds will grow a little faster through that than through the roller crimp because the residue breaks down a little faster. However, if you do have weeds come up, it's easier to get in with a high residue cultivator in the more finely divided residue than to go through that roll crimp field. Another way is to grow a cover crop that's gonna winter kill in preparation for an early spring, spring planting. Uh, this is pearl millet that has winter killed. Uh, it dies out at about 28, 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Third step is you no-till planting of the production crop on a really small scale. You can do it by hand or you can go through with something called a no-till planting aid that just very basically works up a very narrow strip, parts the residues, uh, works up uh, the soil with a shank and then a, a finishing uh, implement. But over here is a no-till transplanter that was developed at Virginia Tech and is now being used um, uh, in various places uh, around the country. Here's some organic summer squash that was planted no-till into vetch and rye. Um, that was roll crimped and it's doing very well. You see a few perennial weeds, but way behind the crop, the, it uh, yielded 15 tons per acre. Um, fourth step, you do have to manage weeds as needed. Uh, the finger weeders are pretty good in high residue. They're much better than the uh, very light uh, weight uh, torsion weeders and tine weeders. They just tend to get tangled up in those residues. Um, I also mentioned that uh, there are undercutter tools as well that can take out weeds. And then after you're done with the, with the production crop, very often you need some late season weed control um, or some tillage to plant the next cover crop. That's why this is rotational no-till. You don't really anticipate eliminating all tillage. Um, in the best case scenario, you probably could get away with a fairly light tillage, a shallow tillage or something and get the next, next cover crop planted. Weeds are the number one challenge in all these rotational organic uh, no-till systems. If your cover crop is even a little bit thin, I mean, that's pretty decent, but you can see it with the, at the triticale here was planted in rows and because of lower soil fertility, you have about two tons of biomass and you can see the ground between the rows. Oops, I think I accidentally advanced. Let's see if I can go back. Thank you. Um, so the weeds are gonna start growing there and when you roll crimp, they'll be ready to take off. Um, Another thing, if you have only if you have annual weeds, we got lots of them. You got a really big weed seed bank. Like when you, if you till up a little piece of ground and it looks like that a week later, uh, you will have too much weed pressure usually for it to, uh, to be successful with this system. And if perennial weeds are present to any significant degree, Johnson grass, uh, this is yellow nut sedge. Other examples are the uh, bindweed and the uh, Canada thistle we saw earlier. Uh, they will make uh, this system pretty impractical. Another thing that can happen is if your cover crop is over mature and it sets seed, it'll come up and compete with the crop. It self seeds. This was actually the same experiment as you saw earlier with that very successful uh, summer squash cover crop. In this case, it was barley and crimson clover, both of which bloom and set seed about three weeks earlier than the rye and the hairy vetch. They were rolled in the same day and they self-seeded like crazy and the squash is having a very hard time. Another thing that can happen is if you plant the cover crop right after breaking sod, after coming out of a sod phase in the rotation, and that is one challenge with, with that system, um, if you then roll crimp that very next cover crop, very often there is enough of the sod left to come up and create a problem. A few other challenges. When you're doing organic rotational, you're doing any kind of uh, no-till with a high residue, you may have uh, uh, delayed planting. Uh, the soil is cooler and wetter, takes longer to get ready. 
You can have planting problems or poor seed soil contact. That's a matter of um, having the right tools for planting through thick residue and ensuring good seed soil contact. Um, if uh, soil warming is delayed, uh, this can be a problem, especially in northern regions. It'll slow down the establishment of the crop. Um, it also slows nitrogen mineralization because you haven't stirred up the soil. You've left it um, completely undisturbed. Uh, and if your soil health is excellent and your uh, temperatures are warm enough, it, um, it could work out quite well. But uh, one of the things that's happened is, is um, in the north central region, these or, um, organic rotational no-till systems, they'll look great in terms of soil health. And yet the um, moisture, uh, I mean, excuse me, the slow warming and the slow nitrogen mineralization can cut soybean yields even by a third and, and uh, corn yields are often cut by two thirds. Um, another issue in lower rainfall regions is moisture consumption by the cover crop uh, prior to the uh, cash crop planting. So there are situations where organic rotational no-till is likely to succeed. As I mentioned before, you need that high biomass cover crop that really evenly covers the ground. Warmer climates, uh, the south, southern United States uh, from California all the way over to uh, Florida and uh, the Carolinas and Virginia, parts of Virginia, our growing season is long enough and our climate is warm enough that there is time to grow a fully mature cover crop and to establish the cash crop and the soil cooling may not be as much of a problem, can even be an advantage. Uh, there's one example of a study that was done, that was some studies in Maryland, some in Iowa, and some in Hawaii. And the sites in Hawaii um, actually had better yields with the no-till system than with the conventional till. Um, so when you have good soil health that's in good tilth, that generally uh, supports um, success with this system. Uh, another thing that that good that, that uh, good tilth, tilth gives you is you don't have to till as much. So it tends to reverse the vicious cycle of tilling and having a loss of soil structure and then having to till again in order to get anything planted. Whereas when you have the good uh, soil conditions, you can reduce tillage more and more and eventually, in some circumstances, go with the rotational no-till. If you have sandy soils, they tend to uh, respond more positively to this system. Um, in fact, I know one uh, farmer who said his squash yields doubled in the, uh, the no-till system, and he felt it was because when he tilled in the cover crop, the nitrogen mineralized and uh, leached out before his crop could utilize it all. And that was in a sandy, uh, loamy sand soil in coastal Virginia. Um, now, if you plant, another trick is you have a strong nitrogen fixing cover of cash crop. Like here's soybeans. It could be edamame soybean. It could just be regular feed grain soybeans, uh, lima beans, cow peas, anything like that. You plant them into a high carbon residue. They'll fix the nitrogen they need. And the weeds, especially the nitrogen responders like pigweed and lamb's quarters and foxtails, ragweed, they will be hindered not only by the physical presence of this mulch, but also by the fact that the rice or, or wheat has tied up a lot of the nitrogen. And then of course, farmer experience and equipment uh, available is, a, is a, um, a major factor. A few tips for uh, rotational no-till. Sometimes it can help just to run the roll crimper twice uh, to ensure a full uh, termination of the cover crop. Uh, you can adjust the planter for higher residue. Um, you, uh, roll cleaners, coulter type, uh, adding weight to the toolbar can sometimes make a big difference. And then on a small scale, um, you can use opaque tarping or weed mat over a rolled or mowed cover crop, which uh, affects a complete cover crop kill and it also suppresses weeds. And here's an example with the landscape fabric between the rows of the, of the uh, crop. So we'll talk a bit about some specific challenges in the Western region. And um, so we'll try to get through this quickly. So we have time for some good questions. I see they're coming in. A um, Couple of challenges, I'm gonna start with the Maritime Pacific Northwest, uh, which is a challenging combination of a relatively short growing season, a really wet winter, um, and then a short, very dry spell during the summer, a couple of months where it hardly rains at all. And uh, the issues are that the residues on the surface delay soil warming and getting that soil warm enough and dry enough to plant is a major issue. Um, there have been some uh, farmer study uh, surveys uh, that have raised some of these issues. And 
a couple of things happened in addition to the planting delays. Um, Efforts to roll crimp some cover crops, especially hairy vetch, when the soil is that wet, um, it actually reduces the capacity of the roll crimper to completely germinate the cover crop. Another thing is that some farmers have observed that even if you use an undercutter, that blade plow, uh, which works best in drier soils, um, I understand, um, if it's used in this wet spring soil in the maritime Pacific Northwest, the cover crops may regrow after the undercutting. Um, and then because of the high moisture conditions, there's a lot of in-row weeds after planting the, the cash crop. Uh, another big problem for horticultural crops is slugs in the cover crop residues. And then um, late in the summer when the rain shuts off, it turns the tables and now all of a sudden there's not enough moisture. <clears throat> and this was not taken in the Pacific Northwest, but it could be a scene there. You have wet soil. Uh, it's been recently uh, waterlogged, and what's coming up is the yellow nut sedge, which is very tolerant of those conditions. So Washington State University looked at uh, strip till and no-till approaches to reducing tillage after vetch and rye um, and planting um, uh, winter squash after these crops. Um, a couple of practical issues came up. One is that the residues clogged their strip tiller. They were using a ground driven strip till that didn't use any power takeoff. So they're suggesting that in their circumstances and the combination of crops and the soils that we're dealing with in the climate, uh, they recommended some kind of a power takeoff like a, a rototiller type implement can be rigged up that just works up a six or eight inch wide swath. Um, now their spader treatment, which was their, uh, their, their full tillage, this is when they had switched away from the plow and disc because the spader was much kinder to the soil. They found it again reduced compaction. It, it really helped the soil warm out and dry out because it does loosen it. But they did find that sometimes it left things too dry in August. <clears throat> Interesting thing is that soil texture had a big role in the outcomes of these trials. On a loamy sand, which is a very fast draining, coarse textured soil, the strip till actually gave better yields than the spader. Uh, on a fine sandy loam, medium texture, the spader did better than either strip till or no till, uh, although those all three treatments gave respectable yields. Now, on a silt loam, a heavier soil, strip till and no till actually led to a crop failure for the reasons uh, that were described in the previous slide. <clears throat> So some practical tips and resources for undertaking reduced tillage in this part of the, uh, the Western region. Um, another thing you wanna look for is, is cultivars of cover crops that will terminate early and are easy to terminate by, I mean, excuse me, they'll mature early, they'll flower early. A rustic rye actually er, is, sets its pollen and seeds earlier than other varieties of rye, the not, variety not stated. Um, Purple Bounty is a, is a strain of hairy vetch that is both early flowering and relatively easy to roll crimp. Um, high residue sweet cultivator, uh, when soil conditions are right, they're really good for taking out the weeds and leaving the residues. Um, and uh, they work with both the flail mower and the roll crimper for the cover crop and found that the flail mower is easier for farmers to adopt for a number of reasons. One is the the termination date is a little more flexible because you're going in and you're actually mowing the crop off. It's making it a little harder for it to grow back than if it's simply crimped down, uh, pushed down with the roller. Um, it is easier to uh, cultivate and control weeds. Uh, uh, that same residue, uh, high residue sweep cultivator can get underneath that loose mulch a lot easier than the roll crimp, which is still attached uh, to the root mass. And therefore farmers are more likely to adopt systems that use a flail mow um, termination method. Uh, here's some uh, experiments with organic broccoli in, the, in coastal Oregon. Um, the strip till system actually had uh, fewer flea beetles and fewer weed seedlings. Um, however, uh, it slowed the release of um, nitrogen for, to the crop. Broccoli is a very heavy nitrogen feeder, so it's very difficult to meet its needs with a uh, minimum till system. Uh, so you had slightly lower, it's somewhat lower yields, 15 to 19% decrease in the strip till versus the, uh, the full tillage, largely because of that slower release of nitrogen. And there were also, even though the number of seedlings was fewer, 
since it was minimum till, the between row reeds, which were managed by mowing, um, did begin to compete with the crop. <clears throat> so they're planning additional research where they'll go wider and deeper with the strip till and uh, use thermal weeding, uh, either steam or flame between the rows to keep those weeds down. So now let's look at another uh, experience in a drier Mediterranean climate in uh, a, a town called Meridian, California. It gets 15 inches of rain a year. Most of it comes in the winter, same climate pattern, but less total rainfall. It's a kind of a slow draining soil. So it's gonna go from very wet in the winter to very dry in the summer. So they tried either legume or legume grain cover crops and mowed, and then they did several different treatments. One is just till the whole thing before planting. Another is to actually do um, a, a very narrow strip till, get the crop in, and then till the inner row space is three weeks after planting, or to do the strip till or the no-till approaches. <clears throat> very interesting set of uh, uh, findings. In 2000, the 2000 season had a, had a relatively dry winter, so the soil was dry and slow to mineralize nitrogen by the time they planted the cover, the tomato crop. Um, the grain plus legume cover crop effectively tied up nitrogen and both cover crops reduced soil moisture. So uh, there were ye sharp yield losses in any attempts to reduce tillage and when the uh, grain plus legume crop was grown. In 2001, uh, there was ample rainfall during the winter, probably a little above average, good soil moisture or tomato planting. Uh, all treatments had adequate nitrogen for the tomato crop. All crop uh, treatments gave good tomato yields in the 40 ton per acre region uh, range. Uh, there still were more t uh, weeds in no-till and strip-till. Um, so what happened was uh, this, this treatment where they delayed the tillage, where it was full with tillage, but the inner rows were tilled after uh, the crop. Uh, the yields looked really good, and it gave good weed control, and it actually reduced the number of passes required over pre-plant -pre tillage because they let that early season mulch hold down the weeds and then came in later and uh, tilled it in. So that was a case where you simply reduce the number of passes. Now, if you look into the interior dry, uh, dry interior parts of the uh, Northwest, um, we have some other real challenges. Obviously, water is limiting. So if you wanna keep the ground covered um, and be feeding the soil, the cover crop is gonna be taking water that you might need for your cash crop. And then meantime, uh, whenever there's no crop, there are going to be weeds are going to jump up, especially these perennials. You got the Can Canadian thistle coming up here, and uh, that's yellow nut sedge. It's more likely to occur in, in wetter regions, but it's just an example here. Um, so, whatever the rotation, all the crops, all the plants are going to be vying for that limited moisture resource. And no till is especially important in these soils because they're especially subject to erosion, especially wind erosion and organic matter is not that high to begin with. And the impacts of the soil organic matter loss after tillage is especially severe. Um, and because of this limited moisture, organic minimum till, organic no-till systems are more difficult to um, implement successfully. And the weed pressure itself is one of the major concerns. Also, it's harder to get enough crop, cover crop biomass to, um, to achieve this kind of, uh, the, the kind of surface mulch you need for a minimum till system to work. So two approaches to these challenges uh, in dryland production, uh, researchers at uh, Montana State have been looking at a five-year crop rotation. They diversified the rotation so that there's sweet clover, uh, lentils, a couple of different kinds of cereal grains rather than just doing the wheat fallow. And then they thought, well, what if we use sheet grazing rather than tillage to um, terminate the sweet clover ahead of the next uh, cereal grain? Um, and they're working on fine tuning that system. Uh, they had some mixed results with it, some yield sacrifices. Uh, but I also want to again mention uh, Villicus Farms, Doug and Anna Cra Crabtree. This is an actual um, biculture cash crop. They're growing a mixture of camet, which is a, uh, or Corazon wheat and um, flax, both of which are marketable grains. And they are able to thresh those together and they separate very easily. It's a, a relatively easy process. They separate on the farm and sell them as two cash crops. 
And you can see there's really no room for the weeds to, uh, with those two crops growing together. And they have developed rotations of uh, five to seven years in length uh, using a total of 10 cover different species of cover crop and 15 different species of cash crop, including oil seeds, uh, cereal grains, and pulses, such as lentils and peas. And sometimes a cover crop uh, is terminated with the blade plow, uh, but they do not have extended bare fallows. If, uh, you know, if there's a short fallow period, it'll be uh, with residues left on the surface. Next only example. So some other research findings, um, no-till very often has severe yield trade-offs because of the dryness. And uh, for instance, in Wyoming, Nebraska, also it's a short growing season, relatively cool weather. Um, however, systems where they reduce the frequency of till, just get it down to once per year, um, and then use some of these uh, tools that reduce the impacts of tillage, such as the rotary hoe, rotary harrow, or the blade uh, plow, um, all of those strategies significantly improve soil health and uh, minimize the adverse effects of the tillage operations on the soil. One thing that several studies uh, that OREI, uh, the USDA organic program funded, uh, organic research um, uh, programs have funded, is that the winter pea, here's Austrian uh, winter pea, um, uh, grown during the winter as a, as a green manure has been working best in terms of uh, providing some nitrogen for the next uh, cash crop, suppressing weeds, and uh, doing so with relatively low water use. And that's another thing. Some cover crops utilize a lot more moisture than others. Uh, pearl millet um, and barley are light users of moisture, even though they're very drought tolerant, whereas some other drought tolerant species such as alfalfa are very heavy moisture users and can really leave the soil profile depleted. So that's another thing to consider in developing a rotation for a reduced till system. So just very, very quickly uh, touch on an example of vegetables that are grown with irrigation in a dry region. This is in Montana. Uh, Helen Athow has been developing and evolving these systems for several decades. Uh, she's worked as a consultant and um, as a farmer and as a conservationist for many years. Um, the challenge that she found for growing, here's broccoli again, a very heavy nitrogen feeder. The challenge was limiting limited nitrogen. So she developed systems that were based on a legume living mulch that was tilled once a year, relatively shallow and light um, in May, just enough to set it back and get her cash crop planted. Um, and then uh, either sell by self-seeding or by uh, reseeding the uh, alley, she gets to cover up the uh, living mulch reestablished. And some of the outcomes she had is that <clears throat> this system really built up soil life and uh, soil organic matter and overall tilth, overall soil health. Uh, she had excellent yields and quality, uh, found the crops were more cold tolerant, had, had fewer uh, pests and uh, less disease. Uh, a lot because the uh, uh, this kind of system, where you're keeping the ground covered and in multiple different kinds of crops, uh, builds a biodiversity and supports natural enemies. Uh, she wanted me to uh, emphasize that her research was funded by the Western SAR program and also by the Organic Research Foundation. Uh, and in fact, uh, her report on this system to OFRF is now available on that on the website. So she worked at fine tuning the system a couple of ways. She tried no-till with mowing or flaming. Um, and what she found was that uh, if you mow monthly, it actually enhances soil life and of course reduces slugs too. Uh, somehow when you mow that grass and then let it regrow, there's even more root exudates and root deposition into the soil profile. Uh, so it's somewhat analogous to intensive uh, management intensive rotational grazing. She also found that because the soil is so healthy, she could reduce the amount of compost from 10 tons per acre down to two tons per acre annually. Uh, to big cost savings, it also avoids building up excess phosphorus. And you can see the kind of uh, bumper crop she's getting out of that is the cabbage on the right, broccoli on the left. Um, and she did find that an annual shallow tillage system is uh, important for optimizing yields um, and it did maintain soil health. Uh, because the no-till by itself, there was some yield decrease. Okay, so in just quick summary, um, what I learned in 
process of preparing this webinar is that the NRCS four soil health principles and a fifth one offered by Gabe Brown of North Dakota, which is to uh, integrate livestock into the system when you can. Uh, you want to use start those use those as a starting point and then adapt them to your particular uh, climate, soil, and uh, site and uh, production system. Uh, till with care, just like the best tools. There's a few examples there that we talked about. Um, consider the uh, soil zone management, the strip till system. Uh, consider livestock integration when it's appropriate to your diver your uh, enterprise mix. Um, now I'd say explore no till on a small scale to begin with and as always, be creative. You know, it's like, I will not be able to tell you how to <laughs> do a minimum till organic farming, especially when it's not in my region. So um, I'm now open to questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, we so are- mentioned. These are these, uh, okay. the other soil health guides that are offered through Organic Farming Research Foundation. Uh, they're new, uh, newer ones on climate and on, um, uh, risk management through improving soil health. So uh, watch for those and we're now ready for questions. Okay, thanks Mark. Um, we're gonna start our question and answer period and we see some questions coming in already. Um, but if you have another question, um, this is a great opportunity to ask Mark and you can just type it into the Q&A box on your screen mm -hmm. and we'll be reading the questions out loud for the next 30 minutes until we run out of time. So if you don't see the Q&A box, there should be a bar with some controls at the bottom of your screen. If you click on the Q&A one, that will pull it up. So I also just want to mention before we start the Q&A that this presentation is being recorded and you'll be able to find the recording in about a week or two on the eOrganic YouTube channel along with all the other webinars in the series. And I'll be putting up a couple more links on your screen which have a link to where you can find all those recordings and the presentation notes which Mark prepared, which has a lot more information than he was able to have time to give on this webinar. And the slides are there as well. So I'll just pull that up in a second after we get started with the questions. So um, we had one um, person who wanted to know whether you have any tips for soil health practices for tree fruit orchards and berry plantings. Ah, yeah, good question. Um, it's pretty clear that uh, keeping the, the orchard floor covered as much as practical makes a huge difference to soil health. Um, we actually did a, a couple of, um, I go into that more in the water management um, webinar, which will be presented for the Western region later this, uh, later this year. I did one for the uh, Heller webinar series that was just uh, general, not specific to region. Uh, but there've been a couple of reports comparing soil organic matter levels in and water use uh, by the crop in uh, either tilled or herbicide fallow versus um, keeping the soil, uh, the alleys and the orchard floor covered in uh, perennial vegetation. And organic matter levels were basically cut by half by doing the bare fallow, of any, uh, whether by, by chemical or by tillage. And uh, in Utah, which is very dry region, water consumption by the um, living mulch system in the orchard floor was about the same as with the bare soil. But tree health during uh, tree establishment was much better because you had, uh, they were using nitrogen fixing legumes, things, uh, bird's foot trefoil in the alleys, and then using a shallow rooted self seeding annual alyssum right under the trees so they wouldn't compete too much for moisture. Uh, that system sustained much better soil and tree health. Uh, so I would say yeah, when you're doing a perennial crop, get away from tillage as fast as you can. And another thing is during the crop establishment, one way to control weeds right in the crop row is to use weed mat or, or landscape fabric. It's not as kind to the soil quite as an organic mulch or a... Um, uh, a living mulch. However, it will really keep the weeds down and it will prevent competition uh, with the young establishing crop. Once your crop is well established, uh, probably you could just go with a continuous cover. 
Okay. Um, let's see. This listener is west of the Cascades in western Washington, and farmers here claim that they must till to dry out wet soils for timely planting, and most of them are seed crop farmers um, who grow spinach, beet, and potatoes. Um, would reduced tillage methods work for what, what reduced tillage methods might work for these farmers on our floodplain silt loam soils? Ah, really good question, especially since I'm quite well aware of that uh, the soil type effect on the uh, results of that trial uh, in that same region with the squash. Um, I would go with a spader because it, it's gentle on, relatively gentle on soil aggregates. It uh, goes deep but does not compact. It breaks compaction. Um, depending upon the crop you're growing, you might be able to use winter cover crops to draw out excess moisture. Like if you're planting potatoes, um, I don't know for sure, but I would think that in, in, in that part of the world, the summer would not be too hot for potatoes. So you could plant a winter cover crop that will draw some of that moisture out and then terminate it and perhaps use the spader. Um, or maybe look into strip till if you have, uh, if conditions are warm enough. But for really early crops like spinach, I know there's an early spring crop and you got to get the soil warmed up for that. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, you. That is one of the most challenging aspects. But again, uh, keep an eye on the, on um, evolving, emerging tillage technologies. I mean, there are new tools coming out all the time that ease up on the soil damage. Uh, and if you've got a rototiller and that's all you've got, I would say look into increasing tractor speed and uh, gearing down the PTO so that you're gently turning the soil and not beating the heck out of it. Okay, is there a benefit of roll crimping a cover crop versus cutting and letting it lay for no-till? Yeah, the roll crimping, uh, it orients the residue so it's easier to run some of the no-till planters and transplanters through that oriented row. You'd have to drive in the same direction that you roll crimped. It also gives a longer period of weed suppression um, on the other hand, if you have enough weed pressure that you know you're gonna to have to do some weeding operations, you might instead need to come in, uh, go ahead and mow, uh, flail mow, so you got finely chopped and evenly distributed residues and then use uh, a high residue cultivator. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, the same person asked, we've been experimenting with no-till and we've had some serious wireworm issues. Have there been studies of increased soil pests with no-till? Um, I do remember slugs being a big issue on Cape Cod when I did my very first organic no-till experiments back in the 19, late 1980s. I had not heard of wireworm. Uh, I am aware that that tends to increase with high residue, so I'm wondering if it would be any less if you spaded in the residue. Um, maybe a trick would be to grow a cover crop that winter kills or to grow a lower residue crop right in your, your row so that um, you could do some kind of a strip or ridge till or something or a row cleaner that cleans the residue out from right around where your crop is. Um, if this is wireworm on potato, uh, that's an issue of the wireworm coming in months after uh, the tillage. So um, uh, it's a good question about uh, soil food web. So yeah, I don't, I'm not really that familiar with wireworm. I'll have to make a note of it. Okay. Uh, there may well be studies that show that, but I know that slugs are an issue. Okay. Um, what are some solutions to slow nitrogen mineralization in no-till vegetable production, especially with strip tillage? Ah, that's a good question. One thing, one general uh, finding is that the more your soil health has been enhanced, the more um, the, the greater the nitrogen mineralization potential will be even under a, a grass legume cover crop mix. Um, if your nitrogen mineralization is slow and you're strip tilling, you might do uh, 
zone planting of cover crops, like planting a legume or a crucifer like uh, tillage radish in your crop row. And of course, you, if you're growing if you're growing brassica vegetables, you'll want to use a legume. You don't want to use a crucifer, uh, you know, a, a radish. Um, so probably uh, you're going to want to grow you know, a high legume cover crop and then in the alleys, um, maybe a grass cover crop that will t uh, tend to keep the nitrogen down in, in between. If you're really having trouble with nitrogen limitation, you could do in row uh, strip fertilization, fertigation, or, you know, just side dress with a little bit of feather meal. Um, a number of strategies for just uh, providing more nitrogen but in the long term, the more you can build up the soil food web and uh, soil health, the more that nitrogen mineralization should improve. Okay, um, here's a comment. One significant problem we've seen with weed mats in orchard production systems is the creation of a hospitable environment for rodents such as gophers and rook voles. Voles oh. have been seen in the central San Joaquin Valley to destroy an organic orchard almost before any detection. Please bear this in mind when using weed mats, especially in young orchards. So thank uh -huh. you for that comment. <laughs> okay. Um, and then another comment on the bro on the wireworms that it came and ate broccoli roots. So uh, wireworm and broccoli roots. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So next question: Do you have any tips for using these methods in a flood irrigated organic raisin vineyard, which is um, in a dry region of California? Uh huh. I don't have to, not right off the top of my head, but I'll let make a note of it. Um, flood irrigated raisin vineyard. Again, um, you'll probably want to try to get the whole soil area covered. I mean, you would probably want to find some uh, living mulch that can tolerate the higher moisture for part, you know, the, the, the brief periods of flooding that, that are entailed in that irrigation approach. Okay. Um, let's see. Do you have any recommendations for Alaska growers? Mm. That is a, a real challenge. Of course, you have the extremely short growing season there. I guess I would lean towards, well, well two things that have been helpful in the north central region. One is overseeding the cover crop into a standing cash crop. And if you're going to have to get in really quick in the spring, you know, think in terms of, a, of growing a cover crop that, is, that, that has winter killed. Yeah, it's, I have to admit, I have, uh, I have very little experience of um, okay. uh, applying these to a, in Alaska. Okay, um, what resources might you suggest for cover crop mixes, especially mixes with, um, let's see, more than, does I think the, I'm just trying to read this, more than eight types? Mm. Uh, I would go to NRCS. Um, if this person is from Montana or even a neighbor or North Dakota, I mean, Gabe Brown has worked with them. Uh, now he's not an organic grower, but he uses very minimal amounts of um, uh, pesticide herbicide. I'm just reading his book, Dirt to Soil. There's a lot for all of us to learn from that. Uh, he did take the conservation ag approach of first eliminate tillage and then phase down and phase out as much as practical the, the um, uh, synthetic inputs. And he's come a long way, he doesn't use any synthetic fertilizers anymore. He uses these very highly diverse multi-species cover crop mixes uh, and has been quite successful with them. Um, there have been more mixed results with the uh, at University of Pennsylvania, but on the other hand, I know there, there are growers in the East and Central United States who have also been very successful. Uh, but I would say, um, in my experience, it's been Natural Resources Conservation Service that have really been most enthusiastic about these very high diversity mixes. And they may be able to give you uh, region specific recommendations. 
Okay, someone typed a comment about Gabe Brown being a good source of information and said that he has several YouTube videos. So you oh, might great. check those out. Okay, um, let's see. Do you have any other um, recommendations on how to help manage slug populations? Uh, well, I know there is a, new, a relatively, well, it's actually not that new, it's been around for more than 10 years. There is a a very low toxicity slug bait allowed in organic systems called slug go it's basically iron phosphate uh, and if, in a formulation that is it, it takes out takes your slug populations um way down um and it doesn't have the doesn't have the high toxicity of many of the other the older uh slug slug baits that are out there larger scale um I'm not really sure. I don't, I, that was it. Is it like a small scale vegetable production, or are we um, uh, talking about slug problems and grain crops or, and such? Okay, we aren't sure yet, but if the person has more comments on that, um, feel free to type that in. Yeah, but that is one product to look into if you're if you're not working on too large a scale. Okay. Um, there are a couple people asking about soil testing. Do any of the soil health guides um, that you mentioned address soil testing? So I know we put up some videos on our YouTube channel and the organic YouTube channel on some simple soil tests that you can do at home. And uh -huh. um, I know we have an article on soil testing um, using chemical tests in, um, for organic farming, which I'll try to find right away and put in the chat um, but uh, if you have any other recommendations to learn more about soil testing. I touch on this a little bit in the nutrient management webinars, and I will also in the risk management webinar that's coming up, uh, because uh, more and more they're finding that standard soil test recommendations are often recommend more than you need, uh, that crops are not removing as much, and they don't really need as much to sustain fertility. And this becomes more and more true as your soil health improves. Um, my, what I keep coming back to is, you know, if you're not certain that whether you're getting um, a return on your investment in the fertilizer, do a side-by-side -side trial. If you say if you're growing broccoli and you say, well, I typically put down 50 pounds of nitrogen, I wonder if I really need more, you could try, you know, try one row with 100 versus 50. You know, and do that a couple of years in a row because you may get somewhat different results year after year. And that's one approach. Um, another is to use a foliar analysis as well as soil to, to make sure you're not providing nutrients you don't really need to sustain the crop. Uh, and of course, there are more and more soil health, soil biology tests coming out in addition to total organic matter um, and uh, there's active organic matter tests. Uh, there's a fairly simple uh, soil respiration test. It does require a lab analysis, but uh, with careful sampling uh, and sending it to the right lab, you can get that done not too, uh, without too much expense. Uh, this is a field that's sort of young, is you know, soil health oriented testing. And in fact, NRCS has just posted, just finished a comment period the end of last year on a draft technical note. It's like a manual describing uh, six major measures of soil health and uh, the laboratory procedures associated with it. Uh, so there, there is, the, the science of biological soil health testing is still young, but it is moving ahead. Okay, um, let's see. Um, has there been research on how long it takes the soil food web to reestablish after it's been disturbed? Ah, oh, that's a good question. There have been some studies. Um, I think it varies. And, you know, again, the, the, the less frequent and less intense the disturbance, the more it will uh, tend to bounce back pretty quickly. Like, for instance, one, one type of disturbance is soil solarization. You're just creating intense heating that kills off a lot of the weeds and the pathogens. And what they 
what has been found is that in general, the beneficial organisms of the soil food web will tend to go dormant. They'll just kind of take cover during that time and then they'll gradually recover over a few weeks. Um, that is a good question. Uh, and I think it's something I need to look into. Okay, um, do you have any more thoughts on involving animals with planned grazing to help manage soil health and sustainability? I think it's a very powerful tool. I am not a grazier. I've never had experience with livestock, but there are plenty of uh, success stories with uh, management intensive rotational grazing. Um, I talk about this some in the, in the new uh, soil health guide at the Organic uh, Farming Research Foundation website um, on uh, carbon sequestration and climate mitigation. There's a, quite a bit of discussion there because one of the fastest ways to build soil uh, carbon is uh, to put in a high diversity perennial pasture or prairie mix and then rotational graze it, you know, really management intensive, brief intense grazing followed by plenty of time to recover. So, oh yeah, comprehensive assessment of soil health. I saw that flash up here. That is a, uh, that's a, um, implement that that is a soil health ma um, assessment tool that Cornell has developed. Um, from what I've seen, is it really is uh, most applicable to uh, climates fairly similar to Cornell, cold and uh, kind of humid continental climates. Uh, it was evaluated in the deep south. I think it was in Texas or, um, or was it North Carolina? It was found not to be that as useful in predicting soil health outcomes and soil health impacts as it is closer to its home base. It works very well in Pennsylvania. Uh, Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable Far uh, Agriculture is using it in uh, a multi-farm project that they're evaluating um, improvements in soil health or levels of soil health. I think it's an excellent model, and I'm wondering if perhaps with some adaptation, it, uh, a very similar approach could be taken in the Pacific Northwest and also uh, for interior dry land regions. Okay. Um, Mark mentioned that um, a risk management webinar, which is going to be taking place soon, that he's going to be presenting. And that one is coming up soon on February 6th. So if you're at interested in attending that, um, I think probably the easiest way is just to put in webinars by eOrganic into a search engine, and you'll see our um, upcoming schedule of all the webinars that we've got planned this winter. And um, that one is called Lower financial risk by increasing soil health. And that one takes place at the same time as this one did on February 6th. And um, we've got quite a few other webinars on soil health, as well as many other organic farming and research topics coming up this season. So I hope you can all join us for those. So it looks like we have pretty much covered the questions here. So I'd like okay. to thank everyone for all their great questions. So thank you again, Mark, and Don sure. has been online for joining us. And um, we hope you can all join us for the many other webinars this coming season. So thanks everyone. Okay, thank you.